All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome again to Learn the Bible. We are going through the Bible. We are now on Revelation chapter 4. This is the Revelation series we have all the way through the book of Revelation. We are on session 10 today. So we welcome everybody who's joined us. Um, we went through the intro letter the, where John sent his greetings. Then we went through the vision of Christ and the commandment that Christ gave him to record the things that he had seen, which was the vision of Christ, the things which currently are, which is the seven churches, and the, and the things which are to come, which are the things that happen after the churches. So we're going to continue on. We finished talking about each of the churches. Go back and check out the previous sessions if you ever forgot any of that. So let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer, and we'll jump right in. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for another day. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that he is our Savior, that he is the first and the last, that he died for us to set us free from the bonds of sin. Lord, we pray for those who can't be with us tonight, for those who are struggling, for those who are suffering, for those who don't know you yet as Savior, Lord, for those who suffer in body, Lord. We just pray that you would be with each one that needs you in whatever way they do need you, Lord, and help us to grow in our love for you, that we might better understand your love for us and what, what you've done for us at the cross, and that we might better understand what's in store for this world, that we might warn people to flee from the wrath to come. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for each one here tonight and each one watching this later. We thank you for all your blessings. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So uh, welcome again. Uh, again, we're picking up Revelation chapter four here. So let me see here. I think I may have mistitled this one on Facebook, by the way, as uh, session nine. It's meant to be session 10. I'll go back and correct that later. Um, so anyways, the we, we read about that vision of Christ back in Revelation one. Then we read those letters to the seven churches. So in the body of those letters, in those seven churches, there's the situation that each of the churches are in. And every church either ends up with the church either being killed off or being removed, or the church waits till the rapture or the return of Christ to either take them or leave them behind. So the first three churches, they ended prematurely. You had the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus was that first post-apostles uh, church, right whenever the apostles started preaching after Jesus ascended to heaven. And Jesus told them that they would be removed. Their candlestick would be removed because they left their first love. The second church was the suffering church, the church of Smyrna. And they were told that they would all die. They would all be killed off. Then came the church of Pergamos, which was destroyed by Jesus because they were so in love with the world. And then you get the church, the last four churches, which are Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And these all represent churches that remain until the return of Jesus Christ. So by the time we get to chapter four, the history of the church has already been written, both how it was from the time Jesus left to how it is still to today. But Jesus wrote all of that or dictated all that. And John wrote it down for us by the time you finish chapter three. So that leaves one more section of the book of Revelation. We heard about the things that he saw, the things which are, which are the churches, and then the things which shall be hereafter or after the things that are. So <clears throat> we've gotten to the section that we're going to read about things prophetic, things that have yet to come to pass. So Christ has already returned for the churches by the end of chapter three. That's included in the things that are, in the age of the church. It's really useful to understand that if Jesus had returned by the end of chapter 3, then we should expect, when we get a scene of heaven, we should expect to see the raptured church there, if indeed that event has already happened. <clears throat> we should see the overcomers from each of these churches already in heaven, receiving the promises that God promised the overcomer. So we know from 1 Thessalonians, we'll get a little more into this later, that in order for you to see any human being, aside from Jesus, glorified in heaven, 
meaning they've been given their white robes, they have their crowns, they are seated with God. But in order to see them in body, glorified in heaven, the rapture has to have happened. That all tells us from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 and 17, it talks about how we go to be with Christ along with those who have already died that were believers. And then in Corinthians, we write about how everyone is glorified at the same time. So nobody right now, when you die, you go to heaven in spirit, but your body, as we can see from any funeral, remains here on earth. But one day your body will go to heaven and will be glorified. But that doesn't happen till the rapture. So if we can find any human beings, children of Adam, and Adam and Eve, obviously, if we can find any of those already glorified in heaven, then we can know that the rapture has already happened. So that's kind of the setup for the view. So let's go back and take a look at these overcomers just real quick, a real uh, quick overview <clears throat> from the Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 from these seven churches. So the first one we get from the church of Ephesus, it says, he that overcometh, this is in Revelation 2, 7, him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So the overcomer or the true believer will get to eat from the tree of life and will have eternal life. Revelation 2, 11 from the second church says, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. They have no fear of judgment. Revelation 2.17 from the third church says, To him that overcomes, I will, will I give to eat of the hidden manna. They'll be given the bread of life. And they will give him a white stone, and in that stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So this person will be allowed access to the joys of eternal life and the joys of heaven. Verse 26 says, To him that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter. Shall they be broken, shall they be broken into shivers, even as I received of my father? And I will give him the morning star. So these, the promise to these are that they will be kings. They will be royalty. They will reign with Christ. The overcomers will have that. Revelation 3, 5 says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before the Father and before his angels, before my Father and his angels. Revelation 3.12, he that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. <clears throat> Excuse me about my sore throat, but... Uh, just from, from talking loud. So in Revelation 3.21, it says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in love. So what we understand, that the people who overcome from the church, the people that Jesus promised the rapture, those who would get to go to heaven at the rapture, we're going to see if anyone fits their description. So their description are people who accept Christ as their Savior. That's what makes them overcomers. And we see that they're in paradise, in heaven, eating with the, from the tree of life. They're guaranteed immunity from the lake of fire at the second judgment. They receive the bread of life and are guaranteed access to heaven. They are going to be kings and rulers over the nations with Jesus and will be given access to Jesus directly. They'll be seated with him. They'll be clothed in white. They'll have permanent residence with him throughout eternity in this city called the New Jerusalem. And we also know from the letters to the two churches that were all overcomers, Smyrna and Philadelphia, that they will be wearing crowns and that they will be removed from this world before the hour of temptation comes. So we need to look for these people. And when we see these people in heaven, we can know that these were the overcomers of the church. <clears throat> um, so we're going to look for them as we go through this chapter. So these are the redeemed of Christ, right? And we, and we know that there's going to be, these people are not going to come from just one nation. They're going to come from all nations of the world because the churches are from all nations. We know that from history and we know that from the Bible. So we're going to see who fits those descriptions. So now in this, we're going to talk a lot in this particular passage about the rapture <clears throat> as we start out here in chapter four. 
There's a lot of views on the rapture and when it happens. There are some people like myself who believe it could happen at any time. And it's before any of the wrath of God comes on this earth in those seven years of tribulation. There's three and a half of those seven years. Half of that time is called the Great Tribulation. But the full seven years are a period of struggling on the earth, a period of trouble on the earth. There are other people who believe that the rapture doesn't occur till the middle of the tribulation. And they have their reasons and their Bible verses that they use to support that. And there are even some who believe the rapture doesn't happen till the end of the tribulation when Jesus is returning to earth. Now, I personally, obviously, I'm going to show you the support for my view. I just want you to be aware there are a variety of views and there are good Christian scholars that can hold each of these different views. But I believe the one that the Bible consistently supports is the pre-tribulation or the fact that the rapture could happen at any second. So we're going to, I believe the Bible supports this in multiple places. And again, we'll go through some of those here tonight. So let's go ahead and open up <clears throat> Revelation chapter 4, and let's start with verse 1. So in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it reads, so John, he had just gotten all those letters. He was there on earth, just kind of a little background. He was there on earth. He was praying. He was in the spirit. And all of a sudden, he saw this vision of Jesus standing in the midst of these seven candlesticks. And it's a terrifying vision. But Jesus says the candlesticks are the churches, and I'm the one who's in the midst of the churches, and I have messages for the churches. He gives those messages. So John's busy writing down these messages that Jesus is telling him, these letters. Then John suddenly looks up, and that's what opens up after he's gotten that seventh letter. He looks up, and here is where we find ourselves in chapter 4. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things that must be hereafter. So the first words he heard after the letters was a statement that said, come up here, come up here. So after this, after what? After he had received the letters to the churches. And how does it end? What happens after that? He goes through, excuse me. Um, so, no, you can um, So, he gets these letters from the churches, and he hears the, he hears the statement come up here. When did that happen? After he received those letters. So everything that's described from here forward is after the letters to the churches have been given. But the final statement in this first verse, after the voice from heaven said, come up here, says, and I will show thee, you, I will show thee things that must be hereafter. So he got the letters to the churches, and he said, I'm going to show you what's going to happen after the things that just happened to the churches. So what happened in the letters? What were the events that happened? Well, a lot of things happened in the letters to the churches, but we noticed for those last four churches, Jesus had already returned. Jesus had come and taken the church of Philadelphia. He had taken some of the church of Thyatira and Sardis. He had, relieved, he had left behind many from Thyatira and Sardis, and he also left behind many from Laodicea. That's the medieval church, the Protestant church, and the megachurch. But the true believers were all taken. So this first verse says, everything I tell you is following those events. So in my view, it's telling us that everything from here forward is following the rapture. Again, if that is true, we should expect to see people that represent the overcomers present in heaven. <clears throat> and we see that John, you know, what it's really interesting, the statement that's told him to come up here. He was experiencing this event. Again, visions are things that you are given uh, a sight or some kind of information about. But he actually went from place to place. He spoke and interacted with the things that he saw and the people that he saw. So to John, this was more than a vision. It's not just some random information. It was an experience that he went through. John was there to experience the end times, the rapture. And he was there to write it all down for us so that we could go back to look for it. So he actually travels to heaven. He's told to come up here 
and immediately he's forcibly taken to heaven. The door wasn't open for a few minutes before he looked up and the door opened right then. Prior to that point, the door was not open. But all of a sudden, the door opened. Um, and what's interesting about it, whenever we read in Thessalonians, we hear that the, when the rapture happens, the believers are going to hear a trumpet. It's called the final trump, the last trump. And when that last trumpet is heard, we're taken to heaven forcibly. It's called the rapture. So when John hears this voice, he says the voice is a trumpet. So John considers this voice to be a trumpet. I don't think that's in there by accident. I think it's showing us it's the voice of God, which to mortal ears sounds like a trumpet blast, just like it did in the Old Testament, back when the first trumpet blast called the people of Israel to be his people at Mount Sinai. Very interesting passage in the Old Testament. It sounded like a trumpet, and finally Moses had to interrupt it so their ears just wouldn't like be, keep ringing. Now, some people will say, but it's not the last trumpet, because the Bible says that the church gets raptured at the last trumpet. Well, the fact is that the trumpet of the rapture is the last trumpet for the Christian. The trumpets continue to blast throughout Revelation. We're going to get to each of the trumpet blasts. And if you don't know what I'm talking about with all these trumpets, and this is your first time through Revelation, it'll become clear as we, as we go through here. But even throughout the millennial reign, there are trumpets blasting the entire time. So the last trumpet in all of eternity will continue on forever. But the last trumpet for the Christian on the earth is the rapture. So that is the last trump for the Christian. So this trumpet last, I believe, is representing the rapture to John. <clears throat> so, um, so he tells him the word, come up hither, or come up here. So these words are only mentioned, this statement only shows up three times in the Bible, come up here. This is one of them. When he tells John, come up here, and John is forcibly taken to heaven. The next time you'll see it when we go through Revelation is in chapter 11, verse 12. There are two witnesses, which we'll talk a lot more about later, but they actually come and they're witnessing for God. They die and then are resurrected three days later on the streets of Jerusalem, on this earth. But then God tells them, come up here. And guess what? They're forcibly taken to heaven. There's one other place you'll find the words, come up here. And that's in Proverbs 25, verse 7. It says in Proverbs 25, verse 7, it says, for it is better that it is said to, that it is to be said to you, come up here, than that you should be put in the, you should be put lower in the presence of the prince who your eyes have seen. So in Proverbs 25, it tells you it's better to hear the words, come up here, than to essentially find favor in the prince of this world. There is a prince coming to this world. He's under the power of Satan. His name is the Antichrist. And people are going to seek his favor. But you would be much better off to hear the words, come up here and be taken to heaven, than to be here in any kind of uh, position of um, authority under the prince that will come. You do not want to be following the Antichrist. He cannot offer you anything but eternal hell. So we'll talk a lot more about the Antichrist as we come through this. Again, I know this is getting into deeper things, and there's a lot of uh, biblical understanding necessary to kind of get these ideas that are there, but uh, it's good to have this on video so you can go back and look at it once you've studied these things a little further. <clears throat> so it's good that we remember about, well, it's good to remember all the details about the rapture. Jesus had told his disciples whenever he was leaving, they said, we don't want you to go. Where are you going? He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Jesus told the apostles that when I go to heaven, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. That was a promise. And Paul later revealed the mystery of the church, the idea that both Jew and Gentile could be the people of God through the blood of Christ. But when Paul is talking about the love Christ had for the church, he said, it's like the love of a man for his bride, the man and the wife. That's the love that Jesus has for the church. So why is that significant? Well, we think about the ancient Jewish manners and the way that they would go and propose and prepare for a wedding. 
So the traditional Jewish wedding is very different than weddings today. So, but it tells us a lot about the love Jesus has for the church. So in the Jewish wedding, the groom would go, the groom to be would come and make a betrothal offer. So he would come to the family of the bride and say, what is it going to cost me to marry this woman? And a price was set. The price was usually quite high. So because you had to be sure that you were someone who was worthy of this girl. So the bride, if the price was agreed upon, and the man said, I will take it, puts a down payment towards it. If the price is agreed upon, the woman, the bride is set apart. She's kept isolated from other men. She's not dating other men. She's not going anywhere privately with other men or anything like that. She was set apart and was unavailable to anyone else because they put in the down payment. The bridegroom, the groom, would then leave the bride behind and leave the family behind, and he would go to his father's house. And at his father's house, he would begin construction on a new room. He'd prepare a place for her. So essentially, imagine that you have this house, nice square, and then you build a separate room off the side, because literally, that's where the new families would grow, in the father's house. So you would prepare the place, and once the place was available, once the living quarters were ready, the the kitchen, the bedroom, all that stuff was fixed up. <clears throat> Often they chair the kitchen, but the idea was once it was prepared for the bride, the groom would return. But the thing is, the bride had no idea when the groom would return. All she knew is that she was looking for him. She Every day she'd be looking for him. It could come any time of the day or night. So the groom could return at any time of the day or night. And when he returned, he was often announced with a trumpet blast because it was a big celebration to know that the groom had returned for the bride. And then the groom would come back, take his bride back to the father's house, and there would be a seven-day marriage feast. And that seven-day marriage feast would be a time of great rejoicing. Um, and we know we, we get those stories from the Old Testament where we see how um, Joseph or Jacob had married Leah, and he wanted to marry Rachel, and he said, no, you got to give her her seven days first. So for seven days, the bride and the groom have this big feast whenever she becomes a new bride. So that story is the same story of Jesus and the church. In 1 Corinthians 11, it tells us in verse 25 that God made a covenant. He, made, he agreed on a purchase price for us to save us from our sins. The, the penalty for our sins had to be paid in blood. And it says that his sacrifice for us was the down payment or the earnest of our salvation. It was the price of our salvation. Yet the world, this earth that we still live in, still needs redeemed. We have been redeemed. My soul has been redeemed by Jesus Christ. But this earth still needs redeemed. So when does that happen? Well, that's going to happen coming up shortly in Revelation. But Jesus put down the payment for my sins in full, and he's already put down the down payment that this earth belongs to him. And it's going to, he's going to pay to finish the deal. So he went back to his father and he's preparing a place for us. So in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, it tells us we are to be set apart like this bride waiting for her groom. <clears throat> and we're all waiting for the sudden return of Christ as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. So what does the rapture tell us? Well, if you read in 1 Corinthians 15, you're going to see that at the rapture, the church is changed in an instant. You go from being human body, human soul, although we've been glorified in our spirit, but we instantly have our body glorified to go and be with Christ. And the Bible tells us where to expect Jesus at any moment. There's numerous verses in the Bible that talks about how the rapture is this sudden secret coming. I can give you all those references if you'd like, but there's also verses that give uh, information about the second coming of Christ and all the signs that make it apparent when he's returning. So there are two, two events where Jesus comes back to this earth. He comes back in the air to rapture his church. We, he does not come all the way to the earth that time, but when he does come all the way to earth, it's, I believe, seven years later where he comes all the way to the earth and comes to judge those that follow the Antichrist and also 
to bring in the millennial reign where this world is just full of a fantastic living situation where people live and they live for a thousand years, they grow, they're healthy, there's no disease, there's no illness, things continue to improve. And we'll talk more about that later. <clears throat> so um, then you get to verse two. So that, that's the idea of all of a sudden, we've gone through verse one, we see that John was taken to heaven and we see that everything from here forward is after the churches. So then we get to verse two. It says, and immediately I was in the spirit. As soon as he said, come up here, John was in the spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So he goes up to heaven in the twinkling of an eye immediately, which is what the Bible, how the Bible describes the rapture occurring. And he was before this throne. So this was not just a vision. He was actually there. So everything he sees is a firsthand account. He writes it all down. So what happens in verse 3? It says, and he that sat on the throne, someone's on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So that's interesting. We have three precious stones described here. The first one is the jasper. That's often a purple or a royal purple, a royal blue, or it can be crystal clear. Then there's the sardine stone or the sardis stone. This is a red glassy stone. looks like a red rock, essentially. So what do these show? Well, what does purple or royal blue show? There's a reason it's called royal blue. It's the colors of a king. So here we have royalty, but stained with red. So this throne has a king stained with red. And who do we know was our king? Jesus Christ. But what did he have to do? He sacrificed himself for our sins. He was the sacrificial lamb. When John the Baptist saw him coming down, he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So then it tells us that there was that, that rainbow around the throne in sight like an emerald, like unto an emerald. So a rainbow is God's promise. Whenever God set the rainbow uh, for Noah, it was a promise that he'd never flood the earth again. And this is a God who fills his promises. <clears throat> he doesn't break his promises. So we're going to talk in a second more about the emerald. But the idea being, here we have jasper. We have these two precious stones that, that the person sitting on the throne looks like. And the emeralds coming across the bow over top of the throne. So Jasper, in the Old Testament, when we go way back to the book of Exodus, we're going to see that the high priest of Israel, he had a breastplate that he would wear on his chest. And on the breastplate, there were 12 stones, one representing each tribe of Israel, and they're arranged in rows of uh, three, I believe, four rows of three. So the Jasper, it was an old, it was the symbol of the youngest son of Israel, Benjamin. So the jasper was the symbol for the youngest son of Israel called Benjamin. The sardis was a symbol of Reuben, the oldest or firstborn son of Israel. So here we have the stones that represents that whoever's on the throne, he's the first and the last. Benjamin to Reuben, from the very last to the very first. The person who sits on the throne is eternal. So it's also interesting that the direct the orders reverse. He doesn't have Reuben first and um, Benjamin last. He has Benjamin first and Reuben last. The last shall be first and the first last. We got to remember that Jesus Christ, he was what we call in the Bible the last Adam. Adam was the father of all mankind. And when he sinned, he plunged all of humanity into sin because he represented all of us. But then Jesus Christ came to earth and became what we call the last Adam. He represented all of us, and he paid for our sins. So the last was made first, but he was the last Adam, but he became the firstborn from the dead. Because of Jesus dying for our sins, we all can be born again into eternal life. He was the first one to be born out of physical death, and we too, if you've accepted him as Savior, will also have eternal life when this life is over, either by death or by rapture. <clears throat> Even the name Reuben means behold a man, but Benjamin means the son of my right hand or the son of my strength and my power. 
The man Jesus Christ was a man, but through his rebirth, through his sacrifice on the cross and resurrection, he became seated at the right hand of God and was given a name above every name. That every time the name of Jesus is named, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Then we talk about the emerald. What's to, who did that represent? Well, that tells us what tribe Jesus came from. The emerald was the symbol of Judah. Judah, the one who had the lion coming from it, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of eternity, is, this is all clues to the identity of who this throne is for. <clears throat> so, so we could go on and on about the symbolism, but you can see where you have to use the Old Testament. The, Bible, the book of Revelation is encoded. You use the Old Testament to decode it. And you can also use a lot of the New Testament as well, but the, the symbolism comes from understanding your entire Bible. So then we get to verse 4. It says, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And this is an interesting group of people. This is something I feel if you can understand who these people are, it makes it much easier to understand when the rapture is and what's happened up to this point. So these 24 elders, they're throughout the book of Revelation. You'll find them again and again as we go through the, the book. <clears throat> they have a handful of features that really reveal who they are. So the first thing we notice about them is that they're already in heaven. These are a group of 24 human beings that have already been glorified, and they're in heaven by the time we get here to chapter 4. They are already seated around the throne of Jesus, and they were seated with him in heavenly places. Their seats are called thrones. They are called kings and priests. They're already wearing crowns. They're very humble. They throw those crowns off at the feet of Jesus. And whenever you look in heaven and you see people in heaven, John only shows us two groups of people before the judgment day that are in heaven. One group is these 24 elders, and one group are the believers who came out of the great tribulation. That's the only two groups of humans you'll find. So if these are not the ones who died or were killed and came out of the Great Tribulation, or even some people argue they were raptured, well, they're certainly not the ones from the Great Tribulation. So who were these 24? They weren't from the Tribulation. <clears throat> we know they're not angels because the Bible tells us they're very different than angels, and they claim to be from all nations of the earth. They're not Jewish because, like he said, it comes from all nations. <clears throat> uh, and we're going to see that they're, again, dressed in white. They're given the crown. They're going to rule over the earth. They said that they're going to rule with Jesus. They're fully aware who Jesus is and that he is the one worthy to open the scrolls. They know who Jesus is. <clears throat> um, and the fact that they call themselves kings and priests shows us that they're actually from the New Testament era. When we speak of the Old Testament, the nation of Israel had kings from the tribe of Judah, but priests from the tribe of Levi. You couldn't have someone who was both a king and a priest. But in the New Testament, we find out that the church are called a royal priesthood. And in the early revelation, they're called kings and priests. So who are these groups? Well, I'm going to say these 24 elders, I believe, represent the church, the raptured church. So just to go through a few of the verses so you see where I'm coming from with this. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17, it says that, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump or the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. 
So that tells us that the, those who are living, still alive at the time of the rapture, their body and their spirit will be taken up to Jesus in the air. And those who have already died, will their bodies will rejoin their spirits in the air and be taken up with them. And we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 53, that at that moment when we're taken up in the air, that's when both our bodies and those who have already died's bodies get glorified to match their already glorified souls. <clears throat> so I'll read 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So the glorification of anyone, both living or dead, in body, happens at the rapture. So the fact that these 24 elders are already glorified tells us the rapture has occurred. And that's a, right along with the idea that that trump or that trumpet, the, art, the voice of the trumpet of God was that voice that John heard. <clears throat> that also goes right along with the fact that the events of chapter two and three, as we mentioned earlier, Jesus had already returned for the true believers and he had already raptured the true believers. So that would go right along with our line of thinking and our line of understanding. <clears throat> so, what else we find about the 24 elders? Well, we find that they match what the Bible tells us about the church, the true believers. Again, we already mentioned they're seated on thrones. That was a promise to the overcomers in Revelation 3.21. They're wearing crowns. That was a promise to the church of Smyrna if they were faithful unto death. They were dressed in white. That's in Revelation 3, 5, about those who overcame from Sardis, or excuse me, from Thyatira. Uh, no, no, it was Sardis, it was Sardis. Um, they were from all nations and languages. That tells us from Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 and 10, that these people came from everywhere. So they couldn't have just been Jews. Well, again, the church is from every nation. They were already glorified. We already mentioned that. They reign with Christ. That's a promise to the overcomers in Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 to 27. Again, in 20, verse 4. They don't go through the tribulation. That's, again, the promise to the church of Philadelphia. Revelation 7, 14 is told that or those are the people that do go through the tribulation. There are other Christians that come out of the tribulation, but the church of Philadelphia was promised they're not going to go through the tribulation. These people also sing the song of the redeemed, these 24 elders. That means they certainly were New Testament believers. <clears throat> so the real question then comes out to, if they fit all of these categories, why is there only 24 of them? Are only 24 people saved? Well, some people will say that they must represent maybe church leaders or maybe the 12 apostles and the 12 disciples. Well, the problem is the 12 apostles and the 12 disciples were all Jewish. They weren't representing all nations, right? But the other idea is, well, then how can it represent the entire church? I think there's overwhelming evidence that it does represent all believers from the entire church. So the first idea is, if it did represent the apostles and the um, 12 tribes of Israel, well, that's fine because all people are believers through the Bible. So you could look at it that way. But there's even more compelling evidence. Whenever you look at the number 24 in the Bible used to represent people, there's only two other places in the Bible, aside from right here, where 24 people represented vastly more than 24 people. <clears throat> so when you get to 1 Chronicles, ironically, chapter 24, um, you actually find that King David saw that the number of priests in the kingdom kept growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Because remember, the priests were all of a certain lineage of the line of Aaron. So that means as generations went by, well, the numbers would just keep increasing. And it was very difficult to organize all the priests. So what he did is he named all the priests under 24 elders. He said that for every single priest, you'll be assigned 
to a certain elder. So it's you, it's based on your forefather. So these 24 men, there were orders of priests based on these 24 men. And then they would rotate their services through the year. They would each do a week at the temple. And then each course would then switch every Sabbath. So if you needed all the priests, you would just say, I need all 24 of you here. And that would bring thousands upon thousands of priests. <clears throat> um, so if I said, hey, give me the priests of Jeshua. Well, the priests of the line of Jeshua, I might get 700 priests that week. So you see that 24 elders represented the entire priesthood. Interestingly, the Bible talks about the Christians, the, the born-again believers from the New Testament, as priests. But you know what else we are? We're commanded to sing to God, to speak in spiritual songs and spiritual hymns. Well, that takes us to the next place in the Bible, where 24 people represented vastly more. The very next chapter from 1 Chronicles, you get in verse 25. <clears throat> and David, as his kingdom grew, he had hundreds of singers and musicians. And he decided, you know what? Instead of just randomly getting different singers, he again organized all of them under 24 elders. So if you wanted the musicians, you would call one of the 24 names. If you wanted the group of the this one band, I guess you could think of it like, you would call by the name of that particular elder. So 24 people represented all the singers. We are kings and priests. We're royal priesthoods. We're seated in heavenly places with Christ. We're glorified. We will, at the rapture, be given white linen, be given crowns, be given thrones. These are all promises to the church. And 24 throughout the Bible ought frequently, I'll say, represented vastly more than 24. So to John's mind, there were 24, but from the heavenly perspective, I see it consistently representing vastly more. <clears throat> so what happens then if these are the 24 elders? Well, if indeed these 24, excuse me, if these 24 elders are the church, well, that means that the Holy Spirit, which has sealed every believer and all believers that are in the church have now been taken to heaven. That means that the earth is left without the restraining, overwhelming force of God's will, preventing the Antichrist and the devil and all of his agents to do their work. So in one sense, the Holy Spirit's been taken to heaven. That doesn't mean nobody gets saved, but that means that Holy Spirit that dwells in all of us and will never leave us and forsake us, if we've been taken to heaven, it's come with us. He's come with us. So that means what's going to happen here on the earth? Well, you've lost that restraining force. You're going to see that spiritual battle that exists throughout the Bible between good and evil and all of the times that the righteous have prevented bad things from happening because God has protected them. Well, we're going to see the earth go into a period of time where things go from bad to worse under the power of Satan and the Antichrist. And that's exactly what we're going to see come shortly as we go through Revelation. <clears throat> and all the systems of the world are going to submit to this evil leader. And you'll see that here. So what? now let's go back, switch back up to heaven. So these 24 elders are seated around this throne. And what do we see on the throne? We'll see in verse 5. It says, and out of the throne proceeds lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So the throne of God was this flurry of power and activity and angels and these 24 elders sitting around it. And Ezekiel, it describes actually the movement of the angels around it in chapter one. <clears throat> but notice again, the Holy Spirit is there at the throne as well. So you have the seven lampstands or the seven candlesticks there in front of the throne, and you have the seven flames or the seven fires, the seven lamps, the, um, you have them there representing the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is now in heaven. The candlesticks are now in heaven. If we look back to chapter one, what was the symbolism of the candlesticks? Jesus told us the candlesticks or the lampstands are the churches. Well, here we see them now in heaven. And we see they're lit with fire, representing the Holy Spirit. So 
all of the church that had the Holy Spirit, or in another word, are saved, are now in heaven. So all of the overcomers of the seven churches are now in heaven. So we talked about the seven spirits of God in our previous posts, how they represent, how I believe it represents clearly the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so Jesus, remember whenever Jesus was walking the earth and he was killed and he resurrected and he told his disciples he had to leave. They didn't want him to leave. In those first 40 days after his resurrection, he had to go. And he told them, it's good for you that I go because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit can't come. And I will be with you forever, even till the end of the age. So he made a promise that the Holy Spirit would come, but he had to go for it to come. But he would remain with them through the Holy Spirit till the end of the age. So anywhere you see the Holy Spirit, that's where the church is. The Holy Spirit seals the believer. The, it cannot leave. He cannot leave the believer because he was promised by Jesus Christ through the blood of Christ. So the Bible tells us in Thessalonians, the book of Thessalonians, when you get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when people are wondering, had the rapture occurred, had the rapture occurred, is the Antichrist here? Paul explains that in order for the rapture to happen, the Antichrist has to be walking the earth. He says that that man of sin, for him to be revealed, to be known in the world, that has to exist for the rapture to happen. So that means, let's say the rapture were to happen today, then that means somewhere in the world on the public stage is the man who would become the Antichrist. <clears throat> so because the Holy Spirit and the church are what restrains him from taking power. But without the influence of God, without the influence of believers on this world, you're going to see things go rapidly more evil than they are today. Um, so again, the fact that the Holy Spirit's in heaven, we see that the church also must be in heaven. So we have the overcomers there. So then we get to verse 6. It says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts, full of eyes, before and behind. So the ground, this ground was crystal, it was a reflective surface. Back in the book of Exodus, we remember that there was something called the Molten Sea. This is called the Glassy Sea here. But in the, in the book of Exodus, there was something called the Molten Sea. And this was this huge brass container that actually was made from the vanity mirrors of the women of Israel. So rather than constantly looking at themselves and seeing their own beauty, it was used to produce a cleansing um, uh, tub, I guess you could think of it, in order for the priests to wash themselves in. The sea of glass makes up the floor of this throne room. That means everyone that's in this throne room has been washed clean. They were royal priests. <clears throat> Later on, whenever the people who come out of the tribulation, who had to suffer through the tribulation, but were still believers and they remained faithful to Christ, those come out and they stand on the sea of glass. The, the here is crystal clear. But then it's crystal clear mingled with fire because they had to suffer through their tribulation. We'll talk more about that in Revelation chapter 7. Um, but throughout the book of Revelation, when you find something to be crystal clear, that means it's totally perfected. And we'll see that later in Revelation 20 verse 11 and 22 verse 1. Those who sit on these thrones have been perfected by the blood of Christ. So then you see these four beasts, these four creatures, these four living creatures, we call them. They were called cherubim back, and they were also called seraphim in the Old Testament. And we know from the study of the tabernacle, if you remember that from the book of Exodus and Leviticus, you'll find that whenever we go, or excuse me, Exodus and Numbers, I believe it is, um, you'll find that whenever they make the, the throne of God, when they make that symbolic throne of God on the Ark of the Covenant, they have to design it with these cherubim sitting around on the corners of the throne and their wings are touching because God dwells among the cherubim. And again, that's a whole different study, but it's a very interesting one. But what's really unique is how these creatures look. And we are, let me see here. We could probably finish the chapter here tonight. 
So the first beast we see in verse seven says, and the first beast was like a lion and the second beast was like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So these are some interesting creatures that are right before the throne. These four angelic beings or angels, they seem to be unique among a lot of the other heavenly beings because to some degree they're modeled after earthly animals, at least three of them are. Um, and they actually have multiple faces as we get from the Old Testament. And sometimes they have six wings, sometimes they have four. But these animals, one of them had the face of a man. So why are these four creatures that are so odd sounding, so strange to our understanding? We have, we have a hard time picturing them having all these wings and these different faces and these eyes everywhere. What exactly are these creatures showing us? Well, if we just think about the general symbolism of a lion, lions, even in human folklore, are considered the kings of the jungle. If you want to watch a movie about a lion, it's always about a lion that's a king. So it's always showing us majesty. That, that symbolism is altered also throughout the Bible. But then when you get to the ox or the calf, they are humble. They're patient. They're beasts of burden. They are servants. Whenever you think about man, man was considered the glory of God, wisdom and reason and intelligence. And then when you talk about the eagle, it was talking about divinity, about this creature with excellent wisdom among the animals and very swift to act. So the symbolism of these four creatures is actually not just in the throne room of heaven, but also throughout the Bible. When you go back to Israel, when they were coming out of the Exodus, every time they would make camp, they had to camp under certain standards or flags. So there were the entire nation of Israel was split up based on four standards, four different flags. <clears throat> Guess what the flags were? Lion, ox, eagle, and man. The camp of Reuben, they camped to the south of the tribe of Levi. And there was about 150,000 of them. And their standard had the picture of a man because the symbol of Reuben was a man. The camp of Dan, which originally was a serpent, they changed their uh, symbol to that of an eagle clutching a serpent. So under their standard of an eagle, there was 157,000 camped to the north. The camp of Ephraim, they bore the symbol of an ox and they had 108,000 to the west. And then finally, the camp of Judah, had its lion symbol, which was the largest camp of 186,000 to the east. If you actually take a piece of paper and shake that and draw out how these people would be camped, if you looked at it from the sky, you would see a massive cross from an aerial view. And really, that's just amazing because at the time, no one knew what a cross would ever be used for. But when God looked at Israel, he saw the cross. And I think that's, that, that preaches volumes. So that same idea of these four creatures and their symbolism, again, shows up in the Gospels. Why do we have four Gospels? Well, each one is showing us a different aspect of Jesus Christ. You have the character of the lion being the symbol of the king, the royalty. And when you open the book of Matthew, you can't get through the first chapter without a genealogy linking Jesus back to David the king. It's proving that he is of royal blood, and even back to Abraham, who began the nation of Israel. So this proves that Jesus is heir to the throne of Israel. And everywhere as you go through the book of Matthew, you're going to see him called the son of David, and every little detail is proving that he fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament. But when you get to Mark, you're going to notice, wow, Mark's a very short book, and it's very to the point. It shows Jesus as a servant, as an ox. No genealogy is given whatsoever because nobody cares about the line of a servant. And on the, and it just shows the surface of Jesus Christ as a serving, as a suffering servant for us. <clears throat> Luke, on the other hand, is one of the longest. It goes, it takes the genealogy of Jesus and it shows him as a son of Adam. It goes through his mother's line, not his adopted father, Joseph, that was back in Matthew to show he was royal. But here in Luke, it shows that he's a human through his mother's line all the way back to Adam. He's referred to throughout the book of Luke as the son of man. Here we see the face of the man represented. 
referring to the humanity of Jesus. But finally, you see the eagle. Remember whenever God led Israel out of Egypt, he said, I carried you on eagle's wings, meaning the divine intervention of God. So here we see the book of John showing Jesus as God. There's a genealogy in John too, in John, in John as well. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It links Jesus as God. He is ever present and eternal, and all things were created through him. So we see the eagle, and all throughout John, you see the authority of Jesus as God on earth. So you see it throughout the Old Testament, you see it throughout the New Testament, and you see it in the vision of the throne room recorded in Daniel, recorded in Ezekiel, recorded in Isaiah, recorded here. Um, so they're covered in eyes. What does it mean, these creatures? They're called covered in eyes. Well, we know from the previous um, verse, we know that they were covered in eyes on their wings and everywhere. Well, the word eyes can also mean they were shining or gleaming, or it can mean that their eyes, they see everything. So these are creatures that see everything. But despite seeing everything or being perfect in many ways, what do they cry out? What do they shout? They cry out how amazing the one sitting on the throne is. I don't think we grasp how amazing God is. We look around the world and we see things every day that amaze us, but nothing can hold a candle to Jesus Christ. The conclusion is that Jesus is holy, that the Holy Spirit is holy, and that God the Father is holy. And that takes us to verse 8. And uh, we'll go ahead and finish from verse 8 through 11 and make a few comments before we call it a night. It says, And the four beasts, each of them had six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So <clears throat> these cherubim, they had six wings, and of course seraphim had four. But these angels had a purpose to praise God all day and never stop, because nothing compares to him. These creatures were created for that purpose. But you know, if you think back about Satan, Lucifer, what he used to be called in his angelic form, he was supposed to be the anointed cherub that covers. He was supposed to have a very prestigious position, but he gives all that up all because he wants to be God. He becomes prideful. He wants God's job. He wants people to worship him. But these creatures, they saw Satan. They saw everything. And there is no one worthy to receive glory and honor and power except for Jesus Christ. These angels remained faithful to their task. And throughout all creation, they would just cry, holy, holy, holy. Why is that recorded in the New Testament? Why is it in the New? Why is it in the old hymn that we all sing? Because God is a trinity, a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. And everyone is fully God, and every one of them is holy. So you can only cry, holy, holy, holy. The only crown you'll ever wear is the crown that Jesus gave you through his death on the cross. It, nothing you have internally or in this world does not belong to him. Our best works without Christ are nothing more than dirty rags. So when you receive that eternal life, that crown, the victor's crown as we talk about it, you put it down before Christ because you owe it all to him, just as we see these 24 elders did. <clears throat> now notice that these, uh, these creatures that have been there day and night now get joined by these 24 elders. They had their crowns on, but this is the first time that they cast their crowns down before the throne. So this is not an eternal event that keeps happening and happening. The creatures have always been saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. That was seen in the visions of the throne way back in the Old Testament. 
but these 24 elders have never been seen until now. This is the first time they show up and the crowns they received for being overcomers were cast down before Christ. These 24 elders realize something amazing is about to happen. They are about to witness the redeeming of the earth. And they know there's only one person who's worthy to redeem it. And we're going to read more about him next time. Always remember, just like these creatures that were created to, pray, to, to praise God, you and I were created to praise God. That's why this world, no matter what you do, no matter what you accomplish, from an earthly perspective, will never satisfy. It will never be enough. You need to look to your Savior, look to Jesus Christ, and honor him with your life. So I hope that this has been useful for you. I know there's a lot of big concepts in here, some things that might be a little confusing to some of you. But as you get more comfortable when it comes to prophecy in the Bible, you, these things you can revisit and hopefully learn more. Please comment below. Thanks for joining us. Sorry for my sore throat. God bless you. And thanks for joining us on Learn the Bible.